Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the PC Perspective Mailbag. I'm Ryan Shroud. It is our 57th episode of this uh, show Q&A recording session. Uh, we are now almost into the middle of September. The year continues to pass by. CES was just last week, I feel like. And now it's time to start planning for the next Consumer Electronics Show, which brings great uh, tension to my body. So we're going to move past that and uh, get into the questions. If you have questions for us, leave them in the comments section on YouTube or leave them in the comments section to this video as it is embedded on PCPro.com. We'll go through those questions and uh, select a handful of them to, to answer weekly. There's a lot of focus on NVIDIA and graphics cards and stuff this week, so let's let's dive on, dive on in. Venger is the first question up. Asks, is NVIDIA releasing 7 nanometer GPUs in 2019, and would that make the RTX series a stopgap? Um, it seems likely that we will see 7 nanometer GPUs from NVIDIA, especially at the enterprise level uh, in 2019. Does that, you know, and maybe let's say for offhand we see 7 nanometer GeForce cards maybe next December or something like that, a year plus from now. Um, does that make RTX a stopgap? You know, first of all, I think they'll keep the RTX brand when they go to those new GPUs. So, you know, RTX 2000 series, would it be a stopgap? Not any more than any other architecture, right? So, um, you know, there is a little bit of question around this, considering it's a 12 nanometer part, you know, kind of a, a small step change in, in process technology, not a dramatic one. But this is how it goes. They didn't want to pay and or wait for the 7 nanometer production to ramp up. Um, 7 nanometer, first of all, understand this. 7 nanometer is going to cost whoever's buying those chips significantly more from TSMC than it would be to buy 14 or 12 or 16 or whatever because those are well established. The yields are high. You know, your cost per wafer are lower. Your cost per die is lower because the yield is higher as well. And you can you only really want to dive into the seven nanometer these these extremely leading edge stuff if you have a significant need from a technological technological standpoint performance clock speed power efficiency and or uh, you have the room in your margin with which to charge more for it. Now, I know a lot of you are out there saying, hey, the RTX series is exactly this. They're charging a lot more for these graphics cards than they did the previous gen. And that's probably true. They they might have been able to absorb it. But think more on the longs on along the lines of like Tesla or uh, they're just, you know, their their AI compute systems where they're charging multiple thousands of dollars each for these GPUs. And that's really what they're what they'll be targeting. I don't consider the RTX 2000 series to be a stopgap. You know, we'll have testing by the end of this month. We'll have reviews up from uh, partner cards and the reference cards, the Founders Edition stuff, and we'll see where these land in terms of performance improvements over the previous generation. I think, I think more. I think you'll be more impressed with those performance deltas than maybe we thought originally. Now, whether or not you'll be impressed still based on the performance per dollar is a, is a different discussion that we'll have to have once those once those reviews go live. I don't consider this a stopgap or anything. This isn't like, oh my gosh, we need seven nanometers, so we have to put something out in the meantime. If anything, you know, these parts are, are later to market than I expected them to be. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, having no problem selling the previous generation, uh, a lack of competition from the Radeon line, and, you know, mining and all that kind of comes into play too. So next question from Davey asks, Davey S asks, is there a general consensus as to whether NVIDIA or AMD GPUs play better with older CPUs? Most of the benchmarks for cards like the RX 580 and GTX 1060 use modern processors, but I'm looking for the best option to upgrade my i7-3770 and GTX 680 system. A Digital Foundry video mentioned that the 1060 might be better for older CPUs, but without further explanation. This is uh, its a good question, and I don't know if I have a definitive answer for you on this. There are some uh, reviews out there, some stories you'll find that will do CPU scaling, testing on modern GPUs. You've seen maybe more of these, I'd say, in the last six to nine months than normal because there's been nothing going on for graphics card releases. So if you're a primary GPU reviewer, maybe you spend some time uh, evaluating other other areas like uh, performance of uh, processor scaling. Um, my, my thought process is that, in general, the difference between a 580 and a 1060 
perfor- uh, performance relative from, uh, say, a, a 8700K to a 3770 like you're using is going to be probably pretty close. I might give the edge to uh, the GTX 1060, if only because in, NVIDIA's driver support for um, DX11, DX9 is a little bit better than AMD. So depending on what games you're playing, uh, I, I kind of lend it to the, the drivers being a little bit more efficient on the NVIDIA side. But I don't think it's going to be a dramatic difference. And, um, you know, you can go back and look and see where these drivers support stop. But, you know, again, you're talking about 3770. As we know, the the processor landscape hasn't changed by you know a huge margin on the Intel side since that release, right? You've definitely we've seen 4000 series, the 5000 series, kind of six, seven, and eight. So um, you know you are going to be limited a little bit if you upgrade from your GTX 680 to uh, something else. But I think either the RX 580 or the GTX 1060 is going to be fine with that with that processor and platform. So uh, I would I would encourage you to just go to Google, um, look up graphics, CPU scaling articles, see what you can find, find stuff that is using the most modern titles. I bet you'll be able to find stuff that has 1060s and 580s in it with a bunch of processors looking at dual core, quad core, high frequency, lower frequency as well. Check it out. Richard Bierne wants to know, with Threadripper being as powerful as it is, I and many others are using it for home servers. So why haven't we seen any good workstation or server X399 motherboards? I love something that ditches the gamer junk for a focus on proper heat sinks, IPMI, etc. Any thoughts on if, when we might see an option like this? This is a very good point. It's something that that we've talked about here before. And it's something that Ken notes fairly frequently. Because uh, we are also we're in a position where we're using a 16-core Threadripper 1950X as our uh, server here in our office that hosts our storage, it hosts our like Plex library, so we can stream from home. Uh, all that is handled there, and we are just kind of using a, you know, like a, I think it's an Asus Zenith or a Gigabyte uh, gaming style motherboard, right? And, and you're right, there there have not been any workstation targeted motherboards for this yet and still even with the second generation early in the second generation we have not seen it uh, I, I do expect that to change right if you start to look at the 32 core part the 2990 wx it's got workstation in the name right so it's not a um it, it's not far-fetched now that these guys are going to start start understanding this and, and putting out more workstation devices. You know, in reality, what it comes down to is these motherboard guys aren't going to throw away money. If there was a market there for it, they would make something. And the truth is, is that the Threadripper brand is successful as it be, as it has been, as um, you know, well reviewed as it has been, and, and accepted by the DIY community. Um, the workstation users are on a slower upgrade cadence. They need a little bit more time before they adopt it. They're used to longer periods of use for single pieces of hardware. So, you know, I think we'll start to see that move in that direction. And, um, you know, I, you know, we've seen, I've, we've used plenty of ASUS W series motherboards here, WS series motherboards here, and I expect that we'll see see those relatively soon. But I do not have a timeline timeline for it. So. I'll keep checking and you keep checking. Let me know if you find anything. Zipzeolock asks, I see you talk with Tom Peterson from NVIDIA often. Have you ever had the opportunity to meet and talk with Jensen Wong? Um, yes. I have, I've have had several conversations with Jensen, um, none, none of them being, you know, let's hang out at the bar for a couple of beers and some pizza type discussions not quite like that uh but i but i've talked with them for let's say you know five minutes at a time five times uh i once was in a cab ride from a hotel to the dinner location that they were having a thing with um he is surprisingly down to earth and one of the things that i have come to realize in my time both conversing with him and all the people that he deals with internally at nvidia quite a bit is that he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room and most of the time and pretty much all the time he really is you know he stage presence is one thing but actually knowing how to run a business how to run product lines um, how to get the best out of these employees and, and this organization is is tough to do and uh, he's been quite successful at it so yes I, I've been able to meet Jensen I've talked with him um, I think he knows who I am I don't know but 
he hasn't come out and done any live streams yet. If that's if that's a question, maybe maybe you, if you're trying to get me to to ditch Tom and, and invite Jensen out for the launch of this one, I I'll see if I can make it happen. But you might hurt you might hurt Tom's feelings. So we'll we'll probably stick with what it is. I don't think Jensen's going to come out and visit Northern Kentucky at my request. Maybe you never know. ZKid1070 asks, should we be concerned about the performance drop that's apparently associated with ray tracing? During NVIDIA's Shadow of the Tomb Raider demo, the frame rate dropped to 30 frames per second with RTX enabled. Should you be concerned about it? Um, I mean, it's it's a fair thing to question. Uh, we don't have the cards yet, and we don't. And when we do have the cards, we won't have the games with RTX enabled yet. They... Even though they were doing demos and they were showing off the the visual capabilities of it, you know the developers we talked to said, "Look, these are this is work in progress. This is not going to be there for the launch of this game. It's going to be a patch that comes in later." The same with Battlefield Five. Uh, th- th- that's that's coming later. Um, you know, there, there's going to be some kind of performance hit, and I don't know what it's going to be, and it, and it depends on what the developers' integration of RTX is, how much they're utilizing ray tracing for that. Much like any other graphical setting, I imagine there will be some scale to it. Um, keep in mind that the the RT cores of the GPU, that silicon space, as far as I know, isn't really used for anything else today. So, um, in theory, you should be able to add some level of ray tracing capability without affecting the performance of the rest of the uh, engine of that of that GPU. Now, of course, when you do ray tracing, you're you're doing additional shading along with it. That's the whole point. So, yes, the the, the CUDA cores are going to get some extra work as well. So, it, it's mostly going to be equivalent to enabling any other high quality shadow effect or reflection effect or quality setting in a game, right? And so, we're going to have to be able to measure it with it on, with it off, make decisions about what is the image quality benefit. What is the performance deficit? And you know, I imagine we'll see in different classes of graphics cards that those decisions will be made slightly differently. All right. So they've only announced the 2080 Ti, 2080, and 2070, all of those RTX branded. So we assume that their expectation is that even down to the 2070, we'll be able to enable ray tracing um, through DXR and Vulkan and, and still get the playable frame rates that we're used to seeing. So uh, obviously, they're going to be working with these developers to make sure make sure that's the case. So we will find out. Maybe not as shortly as I want, but shortly. Jimbo Jam wants to know, if ray tracing becomes the bottleneck for frame rate, going back to the previous question, is there a way to lower the fidelity of the reflections and refractions to improve performance? Also, do DLSS and the ray tracing noise reduction algorithm compete for the same resources? In other words, is there an additional performance hit by running both? Um, it's kind of an interesting question. Uh, I don't know in terms of enabling ray tracing or, or uh, a way to change. Maybe, you know, I only want to I want to cast half as many rays a, as you know the high setting. Will there be high, medium, and low uh, on ray tracing capabilities? Not that I've seen yet. It's mostly been an on-off setting, but we'll see. It's something that I think they could do, but uh, maybe with shadows you could do it. But maybe if you you know they have to design very particularly so that the number of rays they're casting and the pixels they're shading as a result isn't a lower fidelity. You would hate to see uh, like a pixelated, jaggy uh, reflection in a window when the real thing next to it looks fine, for example. So um, in terms of the DLSS, which is the deep learning super sampling and the ray tracing noise reduction competing for the same resources, in theory, yes, they would. My understanding today is that the uh, ray tracing noise reduction is not actually being used in any of the games that we have seen, um, Metro, Battlefield, Tomb Raider, uh, they're, they're, you don't necessarily have to use noise reduction if you're doing ray tracing as long as the ray traced areas are uh, smaller. right? So think of the noise reduction for ray tracing really being used when the entire scene is ray traced or a significant portion of the scene is being ray traced and not just subsets of the image you're, you're finding. So uh, I think in the initial output of this, the DLSS is going to have full access to those tensor cores in the immediate. And um, I don't I don't think there's going to be a competition for those resources. However, yes, I could see there being uh, an instance where that would be the case. You know, there's 
there's only so much GPU compute power. There's only so much ray tracing compute power. There's only so much um, uh, deep learning AI compute power. So all that would have to be taken into account for. T. Tim asks, are the AI functions of the RTX tensor cores tied directly to the drivers for the card, or are they loaded and updated independently online? Could we see a situation where a game plays dramatically different or breaks due to an update on the AI side? Um, so they said, they have said that, I don't, you know what, in retrospect, I don't think I can answer this question yet, um, just because we haven't crossed those embargoes, but I will say that, um, you know, the, the AI inference algorithms that the deep learning that, that, that NVIDIA will do on their side, server side, uh, you know, they, where they run a bunch of compute to figure out how each game should be uh, applied, have DLS, DLSS applied to it. All that gets run in there and then it gets pushed down through drivers. Probably, you know, you're not going to get all of it in there, It'll probably download it on demand. Um, and in theory, they could update it, right? If it's something that's, that's cloud based, you could do it. Is there a situation where it, it could play very differently or break after an update to that? I mean, sure, uh, but that's the case with every driver update that you go through. It could break games and cause new bugs while fixing other ones, and that's something that's happened before. Um, but I'd imagine NVIDIA is going to be fairly particular about this, and unless there are dramatic changes to the rendering engine of a game, the you know the artificial intelligence created super sampling, you know, anti-aliasing algorithm isn't really going to change very much. Um, so I, I would think once that's created, it's kind of going to be uh, a, a static thing. You know, it can be modified and improved upon if it need be. Uh, but I don't think the game engine is going to change a whole bunch. But to say the game engine the uh, uh, imp implements um, a new API or something like that six months after release, then yes, it would probably have to be have to be updated in some some capacity. All right, last question comes from Jimbo Jam again. Any chance that we will get to see Ryan or Josh sit down with prominent game developers like Tim Sweeney or John Carmack to get their opinion on the current state of hardware trends such as ray tracing, deep learning, the Core Wars, VR, and software trends like Vulkan and DX12? There's a chance of that. Um, I have actually I've actually interviewed John Carmack a few times. Uh, once in person at um, QuakeCon that was back in 2011. You can watch that that video where I ask very few questions and he answers them in a very detailed long monologue of each one, which is just how he how he speaks. And it's incredibly interesting information. We do talk about ray tracing in it. We talk about the GPU architectures of the day, the processor architectures of the day. Uh, you can see that that interview is titled John Comerick Interview, GPU Race, Intel Graphics, Ray Tracing, Voxels, and More from 2011. And then I actually did a uh, Skype interview with him back in March of 2008 on id Tech 6, Ray Tracing, Consoles, Physics, and More. And it's actually really interesting to read what his thoughts were on ray tracing back then. This is a decade ago now, um, and uh, it's it's pretty impressive stuff. And again, dense reading, a lot of stuff here, uh, but but worth checking out for sure. So you can find both those. They're still on PCPer.com. Just look up uh, PCPer.com John Carmack interview, and I'm sure I'm sure you will be able to find them. That's going to be it for us. And uh, if you have questions for me or for the team, for anybody, leave them in the comments here. Leave them on the YouTube video. Uh, we have our Patreon campaign going at patreon.com slash PCPer. If you think this content is useful and beneficial for you, we greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, we'll see you on PCPer.com. And keep an eye out for those RTX reviews coming up pretty soon, everyone. See ya. Mm -hmm.